Hello and welcome to Lecture 3C, the final lecture for Week 3 of Applied Immunology. Today we'll finish our coverage of innate immunity by introducing a special class of lymphoid cells which possess innate immune functions, which we collectively refer to as innate lymphoid cells. These include things like classical innate lymphoid cells, or ILCs, as well as a type of ILC called a natural killer, or NK cell, which is really important for defense from viral infections. This will conclude the lectures for this course that are centered on the innate immune system and transition nicely into our next week four module, where we'll start learning more about adaptive immune responses. We've seen this differentiation plot a few times by now, which summarizes the main lineages of immune cells derived from stem cells in the bone marrow. Now up until this point, we've broadly associated lymphoid cells in the blue boxes with the adaptive immune system, and myeloid cells in the red boxes with the innate immune system. Indeed, Almost all of the innate immune functions that we've covered in the past two weeks of lecture are accomplished by myeloid cells, with the exception of antigen presentation by B cells. However, there are a few subsets of cells that are derived from the common lymphoid progenitor, or CLP, that also conduct innate immune functions in host defense. These are cells that we categorize as innate lymphoid cells, or lymphoid cells with innate immune functions, and consist of natural killer cells, or NK cells, and innate lymphoid cells, or ILCs. These differ from their other lymphoid counterparts in several important ways. So the T and B lymphocytes are characterized by a few defining features, including the expression of highly specific lymphocyte antigen receptors. These cells can undergo clonal expansion since they're highly proliferative and are responsible for mediating long-term immune memory against specific infections. Again, these two lymphocyte populations are what make up the adaptive immune system. In contrast, innate lymphoid cells lack any sort of antigen receptor expression. Instead, they serve to amplify innate immune signals, usually cytokines, that are produced by things like macrophages, and in turn produce additional cytokines or cytotoxic effector molecules. They lack the ability to form long-term immunological memory, and due to their function are truly considered part of the innate immune system. Some other defining features of innate lymphoid cells include the fact that they express a transcription factor called ID2 at the common lymphoid progenitor stage, which suppresses their differentiation towards B or T cell fates and makes them ILCs instead. They're found pretty much everywhere, as they're located in lymphoid organs as well as in peripheral tissues such as the skin, gut, and lung. Beyond these properties, NK cells and ILCs differ considerably with respect to their function. Let's first discuss ILCs, whose main effector function is to amplify and tailor cytokine signals which they perceive from other innate immune cells in their tissue environment. ILCs can be separated into three separate subsets, based on the cytokines that they are induced by, as well as the effector cytokines that they produce and the types of infections that those cytokines correspond to. First, ILC1s are activated in response to IL-12 and primarily produce a type 2 interferon called interferon gamma, which is notably different than the type 1 interferons that we've been introduced to so far. We'll learn more about interferon gamma functions next week when we talk about effector functions of CD4 positive T cells, but for now, let's just associate interferon gamma with defense against intracellular pathogens such as viruses and intracellular bacteria. Second, ILC2s are activated by cytokines such as IL-25, IL-33, or TSLP. And in response, ILC2s produce a group of cytokines which are collectively referred to as type 2 cytokines, since they mediate type 2 immune responses against parasitic infections. These include IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, all of which are important in promoting the defense mechanisms of barrier surfaces to eliminate parasitic infections. Lastly, ILC3s are activated in response to IL-1 beta or IL-23 and produce the inflammatory cytokines IL-17 and IL-22 as a result. These are important for defense against extracellular pathogens, including bacteria and fungi, since IL-17 can stimulate chemokine production that helps recruit neutrophils, while IL-23 stimulates antimicrobial peptide production. To sum up some other properties of ILCs, these are typically non-circulating cells, which in immunology we, re we refer to as tissue resident leukocytes. So they sense cytokine cues from local infection and then amplify those signals and tailor the response to more, be more specifically suited to the specific type of infection. Also, as it should be clear from the schematic, the primary function of ILCs is to produce cytokines that then act on other cell types in the surrounding tissue. In this way, they actually have a fair amount of overlap with the function of helper CD4 positive T cells. We'll get into this in more detail next week, but the subsets of ILCs actually correspond to parallel functional subsets of CD4 T cells. So ILC1s are similar to a CD4 subset called TH1s, 
ILC2s are similar to the TH2 subset of CD4s, and ILC3s are similar to TH17 CD4 positive T cells. This is really all we're going to cover about ILCs in this introductory class, but please keep in mind when we start our discussions of adaptive immunity next week that both innate and adaptive immunity are supplemented by the activity of ILC subsets, which can become activated in response to innate immune cues that are indicative of infection by specific types of pathogens. Following along with this schematic, let's next learn about the functions of natural killer cells, or NK cells. NK cells can be induced by antiviral type 1 interferons, or similarly to ILC1s by IL-12. However, NK cells have some additional effector mechanisms compared to ILC1s. NK cells are loaded with intracellular organelles called granules, which contain cytolytic proteins, including things like perforin and granzyme. So, in addition to being able to produce type 2 interferon as a cytokine effector, and K cells also secrete perforin and granzyme, which can kill target cells that are infected with intracellular pathogens, such as viruses or intracellular bacteria. Also, in contrast to ILCs, NK cells are located both in tissues as well as in the circulation, so these are not strictly tissue resident leukocytes. They also provide an important intermediate mechanism of controlling viral infection, as shown in, the, in this uh, kinetic diagram in the center, since they become activated following the initial wave of innate cytokine responses, shown in the green curve and can then immediately kill target cells while the adaptive immune system takes a few days to kick in, which is shown in red. Interestingly, while the three subsets of ILCs uh, parallel three subsets of CD4 T cells, NK cells exhibit similar functionality to cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells, which also exert effector activity by killing target cells. Again, an important distinction here is that CD8 T cells require antigen recognition through their TCR in order to kill infected cells, while NK cells can do this independently of any type of lymphocyte antigen receptor. However, their activation does require a certain combination of signals that are received from surface receptors. NK cell activation depends on the presence or absence of ligands on a target cell that can bind to a repertoire of either activating or inhibitory receptors that are expressed by the NK cell. The relative balance between these activating and inhibitory receptors allows NK cells to then distinguish between healthy cells and those that have been compromised by something like a viral infection. Let's first look at what NK cells do under homeostatic circumstances when they encounter a healthy cell. In this case, some of the major inhibitory receptors expressed on the surface of the NK cell can bind to and recognize MHC class 1, which is constitutively expressed at high levels in most cell types. These inhibitory receptors include some examples in this panel on the right, including KIR receptors, which stands for killer cell immunoglobulin-like domain, as well as NKG2A. Binding of these inhibitory receptors to MHC class 1 results in a negative regulatory signal, which inhibits concurrent signal transduction triggered by a different receptor ligand interaction. This second interaction occurs between activating receptors of NK cells and a cognate ligand that is constitutively expressed by target cells. Again, in this case, because MHC class 1 is expressed on healthy cells and binds to inhibitory receptors on the NK cell, this overrides any sort of activation signal, and the end result is that the NK cell leaves the healthy host cell alone, so it survives. Let's next look at a situation where an NK cell encounters a cell that's been compromised by intracellular infection. Since MHC class 1 is very important for antigen presentation to stimulate CD8 T cell-mediated adaptive responses, it's worth noting that a virulence mechanism used by lots of viruses is to antagonize the intracellular pathways that have to do with MHC class 1 antigen processing and presentation. Seeing as how viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens that replicate in the host cell cytosol and MHC class 1 samples antigen from the cytosol, it really makes sense that blocking antigen presentation on MHC1 is an excellent strategy for viruses to evade adaptive immunity and promote their own survival. Just as a side note, your discussion prompt for this week is to summarize the mechanism of action of pathogen proteins that are used to subvert innate immune signaling. We call these proteins virulence factors, or with viruses, they're called immunoevasins. So if you're interested in studying a viral immunoevasin for this week's discussion assignment, then pay close attention to this part of the lecture. NK cells provide a way for the immune system to recognize cells that have been compromised by viral infection, and they do this by interpreting a lack of or modification of MHC class 1 as a sign of pathogenic infection. In this case, we usually refer to a complete lack of MHC class 1 as missing self, while altered MHC1 that can't bind to inhibitory receptors is referred to as dysregulated or altered self. Dysregulated self can be induced when viral immunoevasins change the conformation of MHC class 1 
And this is done in an effort to prevent antigen presentation to cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. And so in this case, the virus successfully avoids CD8 T cell activation, but then leaves itself susceptible to killing by NK cells. Let's revisit the schematic from the textbook, this time looking at an example where a target cell is perceived as dysregulated self. Here, the MHC class 1 molecule is now represented in blue instead of yellow, which indicates that it has been somehow altered by viral infection such that it can no longer bind to inhibitory receptors expressed by the NK cell. In the absence of inhibitory receptor activation, the activating receptor in green is bound to activating ligands on the target cell in orange and is free to signal. So activation of this class of NK cell receptors leads to the release of cytotoxic granule contents, including um, things that we just introduced, which are perforin and granzyme, and this kills the infected target cell through apoptosis. This panel on the right shows some examples of activating receptors that are expressed by NK cells. These include some uh, different KIR family members, as well as NKG2C. The last mechanism of NK cell activation that we'll cover today is through the detection of stress-induced self. Um, this is a cellular state that is, of course, triggered in um, states of cellular stress, which include intracellular infection, metabolic stress, or oncogenic transformation of cancer cells. In these situations, the stress cell will express a series of molecules that can bind to receptors on NK cell and activate them, and importantly, this occurs regardless of MHC class 1 expression status. In this sense, the stress-induced cellular state allows for more direct sensing of compromised cells that need to be killed by cytotoxic mechanisms. And again, this overrides any NK cell signals related to MHC class 1 expression on the target cell. NK cell receptors that detect stress-induced self include a family of receptors that are produced in response to physical damage called natural cytotoxicity receptors, or NCRs. And these include things like NKP30, NKP44, and NKP46. The cellular state can also be sensed by a receptor called NKG2D, which binds to target cell ligands such as MYC-A, MYC-B, and RATE1 family members shown here on the right, all of which are structurally similar to MHC class 1 and are upregulated in response to infection and stress. So to quickly summarize, NK cells can become activated in response to cells that either lack functional MHC class 1 or those that have upregulated stress-associated ligands. Since these triggers are most often induced during viral infection, as well as in states of oncogenic transformation, NK cells are really viewed as an extremely important innate lymphoid cell type involved in innate immune responses against viruses. So we finished our coverage of innate immunity today by learning about new populations of immune cells called innate lymphoid cells. These are derived from the same lymphoid lineage as T and B cells, but unlike these lymphocytes of the adaptive immune system, innate lymphoid cells execute important innate immune functions in the absence of antigen receptors. These cell types include innate lymphoid cells, or ILCs, um, who primarily function by tailoring the cytokine responses to certain types of infections. And interestingly, the subsets of ILCs parallel the subsets of helper CD4 T cells, which we'll learn more about next week. Another subcategory of innate lymphoid cells are NK cells, or natural killer cells, and these differ from classical ILCs in a number of important ways, the most important being that they can execute cytotoxic functions instead of cytokine responses. We've learned that NK cells are capable of detecting cells that have been compromised through combinations of receptors that indicate a cellular state of either missing self, dysregulated self, or stress-induced self, and that all of these cellular states likely indicate either viral infection or oncogenic transformation of target cells. And for these reasons, NK cells are a crucial cell type that's involved in the elimination of virally infected host cells. So this concludes our lectures for week three. Please remember to complete the reading assignment for this week's module on innate immunity, which is in the syllabus and will also be posted to Canvas. This is also a reminder to complete your discussion board assignment for this week if you want it to count for one of your four graded discussion boards. This week's prompt involves summarizing the mechanism of action for a virulence factor, so please see the discussion assignment on Canvas for more details. You have an optional extra credit quiz due for this week as well if you want to submit that. So good luck with your assignments and see you next week for our first lectures on adaptive immunity.